Since several years, I have received the press releases from Stan Meyer of the Water Fuel Cell Corporation. When I was asked to invite some U.S. participants to this conference, Stan Meyer came to my mind immediately. So I wrote him a personal letter, and I'm very, very happy that he came over. He has about 40 patents related to energy. He is one of the most brilliant inventors, and I want to make this introduction very short to give him more time to present his water fuel cell. Stan Meyer, please. Go ahead. One of the things we address with the natural water is like a sponge. It will absorb ambient air. What proves that out? Any of you gone fishing? You ever look at the gills of a fish? The gills of a fish does not change the molecular or the chemical structure of water. The only thing it does is agitates the water molecule to re release dissolved air. You know, in my ninth grade science class, I asked a question that when you light a match in the air, why does not the air burn up? Because the bulk of the air is composed of non-combustible gases like nitrogen that do not support the burning process. We had found out that the water fuel cell is a multi-gas generator. It not only releases the hydrogen and oxygen gases from water uh, uniformly based on the applied voltage potential, it also now releases the ambient air in a bulk of non-combustible gases, or gases that do not support the burning process. And as a result, we now lower the burn rate of hydrogen gas from 325 centimeters a second around the 47 centimeters, 47 centimeters a second to co-equal that of natural gas. Go ahead. How do you run an internal combusted engine off this type of technology? Well, as an engineer, you look at the internal combustion engine in three ways. Number one, is it a mechanical drive device to get us here today? Secondly, is it not an air pump? Will it not pump in the ambient air through the cylinder and shove it out the exhaust? Is it not also a manufacturer of non-combustible gases? That when the burning process, the gas combustion process occurs, it produces non-combustible gas that we meter back meter mix back with the water fuel cell that we can automatically adjust the burn rate of the hydrogen gas to co-equal gasoline or diesel fuel or any form of fossil fuels. Go ahead. Well, let's take some of the knowledge that has been presented to you and see if we can't come up with an apparatus capable of using water as a new fuel source, both for its application and utilization of gas energy as well as electrical energy. And I put the logo on there because the Lord had talked, or when he was talking to Job, asking that it, if he had known anything about the characteristic and knowledge of water. So the Lord really specified that the knowledge of water would come out of time of great trouble. In the development of the water fuel cell technology, the main thrust was, number one, legalize its technology. Do not blow your ego because it was imperative that this technology would be protected for the world economic market. In my files back home in my laboratories, I have the most scientific compilation study on a hydrogen that has ever come out of the scientific world through NASA, where the, ten, the United States government spent more than $10 million to tell me that hydrogen was the most advanced, the best or ideal fuel source that could be used and brought into the economy very quickly. But in the report specified that there was three major areas that had to be addressed. Number one, be able to produce the hydrogen gas economically, control the rate of its production, adjust the burn rate of hydrogen gas to co-equal that of the fossil fuels, and I added a fourth one, the ability to transport the hydrogen gas without spark ignition. Those who are electronic engineers, you know that there are two aspects to electrical power. There are amps and there are voltage. But the only time you consume the electrical power is you consume it in the form of amps. If you were to restrict the amp flow, you have voltage left over. Voltage is a form of potential energy. It is not consumed energy. And as a result, we're now using potential energy to perform work.
Yeah. Yeah. We had found out that the electrical polarization process occurs in all forms of natural water, even including the most purest form of distilled water. Once we realized the fu fundamental operational characteristics and parameters of the electrical polarization process, we now raise the voltage amplitude by which we now take the water into the liquid to gas ionization state. As we take it into the liquid to gas ionization state, the voltage potential is now ejecting or pulling away the electrons from the combustible gas atoms. We had found out that when you attenuate voltage amplitude in reference to pulse frequency, you will hit the phenomena of resonant action by which you are producing a tremendous quantum leap in hydrogen generation over the prior art. We also found out that once you hit resonance and subject it to the stimulation of the pulse voltage and then switch it off, then the hydrogen will continually be produced on the power off put stage. Example being that once you hit a resonance, we get excited for five seconds and you're producing gas for 94 seconds. You divide five into 94, we were producing gas, hydrogen gas, 19 times more on the power off put stage than on the power input stage. We also realize that if you will leave the pulse voltage frequency continuously or constant, and don't touch the apparatus, hydrogen gas is now being produced on a geometrical configuration and will continue to increase in production of a hydrogen gas until such extent that you would reach the maximum flow rate of water going into the resonant cavity. So we now have another form of control of regulating hydrogen gas production. These operational parameters now satisfy the second major requirement of NASA to use hydrogen as a fuel source that we can control the hydrogen gas on demand. We are now starting to aid the electrical polarization process by injecting laser energy into the system. And by doing so, we are now causing even a faster and a greater rate of hydrogen production to occur, as you see right here. But we are also doing something else. We want to take the combustible gas atoms even to a higher energy state. This is an example of a laser injection resonant cavities. Those cavities themselves like to be extremely small since they're taken on a form of a capacitor. We use solid state lasers in injection of photon energy into the process. Those in electronics, they are simple little LEDs, light emitting diodes, but they will produce a, a coherent light. We don't need a large light intensity to accomplish the task. We don't want to focus the energy down to a concentrated point we want to allow the light or the photon energy to be absorbed by those liberated combustible gas atoms. There's an example of what happens when you subject water molecules to a high pulse voltage frequency and allowing the laser uh, pulse frequency to be superimposed within the process. As we started to do our experimentation, we had realized that there were many phenomena that were occurring in order to bring about the results of using hydrogen as a fuel source. Going from the random state to the alignment, to the polarization, to the molecular elongation, to the liquid to gas ionization state, but we are also going down to the atomic destabilization of the water molecule. This is an example now of a vertical array resonant cavity stacked together, and as the lower resonant cavity releases its electrically charged combustible gas atoms, it is now injected into the second cavity, which increases the process and eventually will now allow a tremendous amount of hydrogen gas to be produced at the top. Examples that you can subject it to 110 volt pulse frequency, and yet you are now compounding the increase of voltage equivalent to 1,000 volts in the upper resonant cavity. There's an example of a three-tier resonant cavity configuration. Now, once we had found out that we can use hydrogen as a fuel source and release it and control its rate of production, hydrogen is extremely volatile, as we all know. If you ignite it with ambient air, it burns around 325 centimeters per second. 
The blue zone signifies the ability of rendering hydrogen safer than that of natural gas. This is the number one area that gave us the ability to retrofit hydrogen to any existing energy consuming device and do it economically because if I can adjust the hydrogen burn rate to co-equal fossil fuels, then it is not needed for me, for an example, to change the design configuration of an internal combustion engine. But also had to comply with both the federal and state and local highway safety code regulations to render this type of fuel cell safer than water. We address the phenomena of natural water, that water is like a sponge, it will absorb ambient air. Those who have gone fishing knows that if you look at a gill of a fish, the gill of the fish simply agitates the water molecule to release the dissolved air. When you light a match, the question being is, why does not the air burn up? Because the bulk of ambient air is composed of non-combustible gases or gases that do not support the burning process. Likewise, the fuel cell is a multi-gas generator. It is also releasing ambient air, which is absorbed by the water. As a result of this multi-gas being released, we automatically can adjust the burn rate of hydrogen gas from 325 centimeters a second down to around 47 centimeters a second, co-equaling that of natural gas. Since I'm using the gas as coming off the flame, does it cost them anything? No Zippo other than the apparatus itself. Now we were confronting that in the prior technology that they were changing the design of the engine and the compression strokes and trying to use very exotic materials. The key was that we need the cars to run and the trucks. So how do we run an internal combustion engine? As an engineer, you will look at this in three ways. Number one, the engine is a mechanical drive device. Secondly, it's an air pump. It will pump air through the carburetor and send it out the exhaust. Thirdly, you look at an internal combustion engine that it is a manufacturer of non-combustible gases. So we now simply take the gases that's gone through the burning processes that has eliminated the burning product in the fuel and also eliminated the oxygen atom and as a result now metered mix back into the fuel cell. And we now automatically adjusting the burn rate of that hydrogen gas to co-equal that of gasoline or diesel fuel and as a result you do not have to change any of the design characteristics on an existing engine. In order to comply and ensure that we have a system that does not produce nitrous oxide which would be minuscule in application we now expose it to a catalytic block allowing the, hemis allowing the design of the hemisphere itself to re redirect any gases back into the flame that may escape the combustion process and as a result we have a way of converting 100% of the gases coming out of the fuel cell. So as we liberated the gases from water, we are now resubjecting those liberated gases to even a higher pulse voltage frequency. We are restricting the amps and our voltage to take over to perform its work. We are now injecting laser energy into process to aid the ejection of the electrons. Okay. Yeah. So basically what I'm doing now is that I am now taking the combustible gas ions and I am now bringing it into subcritical state. I've pulled off the electrons. I have now subjected to photon energy and what I'm now doing is taking combustible gas atoms and putting them in the subcritical state. In order to do this I had to invent now the electron extraction circuit. When I developed the electron extraction circuit which I shut off the flow of amps on voltage to take over to eject the electrons, I now come up with an alternate way of redirecting those liberated negative electrons and as a result if you would apply the B plus across a filament of a light bulb, then those negative charge electrons will go into the filament and to react to produce heat in the form of light energy. But what I'm now illustrating to you that not only are we setting up the condition 
to bring about the hydrogen fracturing process, we are now producing electrical energy simultaneously. With that electrical energy now can be recycled back in electronic circuits to aid the voltage intensifier circuit to perform the electrical polarization process. This is an example now that when you inject the combustible gas atoms to laser energy, it causes the electrons to go to a higher energy state, which now allows electrons to be ejected from the oxygen atom, as an example. And by subjecting it to the pulse voltage frequency, we pull away the electrons, and then we consume the electrons and not allow the electrons to go back into the process. So we are now keeping the combustible gas atoms into a very critical state. To do this, we have now developed what is called the hydrogen gas gun technology. Now, basically what we are doing is we know that, in fact, that when you ignite hydrogen and oxygen gases, it will release the thermal explosive energy up to two and a half times that of gasoline. The scientific question that was to be asked at this particular point is that what happens during thermal gas ignition of hydrogen if you could prevent the formation of the water molecule from occurring? In other words, if you could prevent the formation of the water molecule from occurring and could not reach stable state, then in fact you, that explosive energy would keep continuing to be released from the process until such time either a new atom structure is formed or that an implosion effect and release pure energy. Now since the energy problem has been occurring in the scientific world, uh, Livermore Laboratories has been trying to use a hydrogen fusion, as you know, by taking hydrogen and subjecting it to high temperatures and high pressures around 10 million degrees and putting it in an electromagnetic bottle and trying to release its energy. Another process which was very successfully demonstrated in the university environment is called the muon process. Now we know that if you will decrease the mass of an atom, it must release its energy. And under the muon process, they took a muon, which is twice the size of an electron, and caused the hydrogen atom to accept the muon and reject its natural electron. Now, once that has occurred, then decay comes about on the muon, and once the muon decays, then the hydrogen atom no longer stays in, a, in existence, and the energy that's there to hold the electron in its outer orbit is no longer there, and therefore, under the law of physics, everything must be stabilized and therefore releases tremendous amounts of energy. What we are now doing is setting a subcritical mass of combustible gas atoms, decreasing its mass size, and allowing and preventing the formation of the water molecule from occurring to release phenomenal amount of energy. Now, this is an example of taking the hydrogen gas gun and putting it on top of the resin cavity. Matter of fact, the hydrogen gas gun can be reduced down to the size of a spark plug or the gas injector system of an F-15 or an F-18 and literally fly an F-18 or a 15 on the atomic power of water. Now to give you an example of the hydrogen fracturing process to prevent the formation of the water molecule is that Ike and I are on a basketball court and he's the hydrogen atom and I'm the big oxygen atom. Now I'm eight times bigger than he is, right? Now, what I've done is I've zapped at Ike with laser energy. And because I had hit him with laser energy, his electron migrates farther away from the nucleus. And as a result of that, the electrical attraction force between that electron and nucleus becomes weakened. So he is now in a weakened state. But I am the big oxygen atom, and I got four missing electrons, and then the law of physics says I want to stabilize, and I need some electrons. But I'm also injected with laser energy, and I'm in a highly energized state, and that ener absorb laser energy, and the nucleus is preventing me from allowing me to go back to stable state. So I have an abnormal state, I'm in a subcritical state, and then I am then subjected to thermal ignition. And so as a result, the hydrogen oxide atom seeks to come together to form the water molecule, but it is not in stable state. And as a result of that, an avalanche effect occurs, and once that takes place and stabilization cannot occur, you start to release thermal explosive energy of a fantastic magnitude. This process in the hydrogen fracturing process, the potential yield is 2.5 
million barrels of oil per gallon of water. And since there is no neutron interaction in the process, it is a very clean process. So we now have the abilities to retrofit the technology to any form of aircraft you so desire, even rocket engines. We can take even the liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen subjected to the hydrogen fracturing process and obtain tremendous mock yields where the United States was originally developing a hydrogen power aircraft to go Mach 25. It is now slated to go Mach 150 in outer space with this type of technology. Inherently, as you're releasing the gas from water, it produces as a byproduct gas pressure, does it not? And as a result of releasing that gas, you now can allow, as the gas goes through to up or to the nozzle, if you put a turbine wheel and subject it to the gas pressure being escaping, you will turn the turbine wheel with hooks to a second turbine wheel to move the magnetized gas to produce the electrical energy. Now, gentlemen, we're producing electrical energy bypassing thermal chemical interreaction and nuclear interreaction. The only thing I'm using is gas pressure to generate electrical energy. And I'm now producing electrical energy without consuming the fuel source. Another development was called the gas battery or the electrical polarization generator by which we are inherently destabilizing the oxygen atom. We are pulling off its electrons, which now takes on a positive electrical charge. We now can direct those positive electrical charges into an uh, electrically insulated cavity, expose it to electrical conductive plates like stainless steel 304 material. And we know in physics that when electrically charged particles are exposed to electrical conductive plates, it now becomes positive electrical charge, does it not? And we simply link those electrically charged plates to a terminal, and therefore the terminal becomes positive electrically charged. And we know in physics that anything in differential of anything will perform work. And since we have a positive electrical potential, we now can hook it to ground through load, and we can cause the negative charge electrons to migrate up to the oxygen atoms on the plates, and as a result, now produce electrical energy bypassing all mechanical applications. For an example of this is what happens if we would take one billion oxygen atoms that had four missing electrons, how many electrons could migrate to the plates? Well, it would be four billion electrons, would it not? So as the generator is producing the gas, we are now also generating electrical energy simultaneously in the process, and we can accomplish the task in five different ways so the process is a self-sustaining oscillation system that once you excite it from an external source, it maintains itself as long as there is water in the fuel cell. I think this was a very historical moment for you.